Well, hello, <laughs> stargazers, and especially some of you new people that may have joined us after we talked about us on Friday night, the, what was it, 3rd of November. We're now into the new week here, and it's our big weekly special vlog, Monday mornings, 11 to noon, we call the SBAU Astro Hour. So on behalf of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, South Central Coast of California's longtime Astrophysics and Telescope Club, based at and supported by our beautiful Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, where SBAU holds our first Friday of the month general meeting, 7.30 p.m., and that's right after a freebie in the beautiful Gladwin Planetarium. And we host this very popular outdoor star party on the second Saturday. That's upcoming. We'll talk about that in a minute. Starts at dark. Actually, it'll be starting probably about an hour after dark. We'll find out here right next to the museum's Palmer Observatory. If you're interested in astronomy, boy, come and join us. Check us out on sbau.org. Watch us live, do these Monday get-togethers, <clears throat> talking heads featuring old men on the screen. But there's some brains here, I got to tell you. We're on YouTube, and you can comment or ask questions, and we cover it all. Anything out there, we're going to be down on the earth a lot for this uh, session with the talking points. If um, I'm your host, Ron Heron, Vice President, stand by to meet the rest of the gang. Uh, we're going to talk this time this uh 142nd episode for november 6th monday through sunday the 12th of november 2023 about co2 and uh probably global warming going to compare the sun's emitted light to the trap stuff covering 800,000 years of co2 graph we got it's interesting stuff about what's going on on the earth we think another asteroid flyby we fly by the asteroid this time they don't fly by us it's called Dinkinesh, and it's got a little moon around it. NASA's Lucy mission with an update and photographs. A visit to NGC 2170. That's the Angel Nebula. And we'll check on the Lemon Comet. Let's introduce you to the guys. My good friend, after all these years, still the president. We're running again. Jerry Wilson, who's <laughs> running the show. <clears throat> and Jerry is married to Pat Forgey. And pretty much sends out incredible, I don't know how we have a nonstop supply of talking points. Chuck McPartland's with us in front of the flag of Ukraine. He's our outreach coordinator. And he does whatever needs to be done. If we're shorthanded, he and his wife, Pat, who is merchandise manager. She's running for, I guess, Colin Taylor's job as our treasurer in December. Bruce Murdoch joined us. He's on the screen, a longtime yeah. supporter, telescope enthusiast. Mary DeBonny also happens to be president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Also joining us is our beloved former Westmont College science instructor and editor of the newsletter, Tom Whittemore. Morning. Who is married to the beautiful Maureen Whittemore. And finally, here's Tim Crawford, a regular resident lens and telescope expert and a longtime SBAU member. Uh, wife is Karen, and uh, I guess occasionally you still show up on the workshop uh, Tuesday nights. It's been moved back to Tuesday, right? It yes. Went to Thursday briefly. And... Yep. All Found right. Let's do some silly stuff. Uh, President Jerry likes to send us uh, forwarded silly science cartoons every week. We'll get at least a half a dozen. Let's see if I can match them here. All right. I wrote something down about this. This is Professor Richard Feynman, who says, you know, knowledge. Yeah, he was witty. What yeah. is my He's what? He was very witty. Yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah, I, may, I may need some. Uh, is this supposed to make me laugh? Knowledge isn't free. You have to pay attention. So it's a pun. <laughs> it's Play a pun. A yeah. And of course, uh, President Biden could forgive your student loan on that one, but that's all right. <laughs> pay attention. All right. Here's the, this is the European boo, a ghost in Europe, uh, trying to scare an American who freaks us out. With kilograms, centimeters, kilometers, centigrade. Oh, my God, it's yeah. macabre metric. I assume that's the point of the cartoon. Yeah, Americans are ter terrified of the metric system. <laughs> Nothing else bothers us. And we'd probably welcome it, wouldn't, wouldn't we? Well, in science, it's already used universally worldwide. Yeah. It's just, just in engineering. Why don't we make of a deal? We'll go left side of the road driving if uh, they'll... No, we'll take their metric if they'll go to the right side of the road. Here we go. Yeah. Well, you know, I had an experience in Argentina when I was um, skiing down there. And uh, I'm sorry, Australia. 
and uh, they drive on the wrong side of the road and everything. But when you come upon somebody, you go to the right. Well, I was going to the left because everything goes to the left, and the people that were the natives were going to the left too. So we we didn't collide. But you know, as soon as I spoke, they realized that I wasn't an Aussie. You were <laughs> passing. You were passing cars on the left onto the no, show. No, I'm skiing. I'm skiing. I'm uh, oh, skiing. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Those people, they also walk on sidewalks on the left. Did you know that? I, yes, I do. And I'm going in up and down the subways in London. Um, I was always, if I didn't think about it, I was always facing a mass of people coming the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered how I would do on a road in a British country. All right. There was, a, is, there was a Romanian, a Romanian guy here uh, that had moved to California that was trying to, you know, learn English. And so he went to Toastmasters and they gave him a, an assignment to give a talk on why we drive on the side of the road we drive. <laughs> and he said, well, we, we drive on the top surface of the road because it takes so much more energy to drive <laughs> on the undersurface. <laughs> OK, let's look at the screen again. Cross a cow with an octopus and you get an under, utter calamity underwater. Let me tell you right now. There it is. What do you get? Visit from the Ethics Committee and an immediate withdrawal of your funding. <laughs> You've heard the theories. They think uh, octopi are from another planet. They were sent here. Here's yeah, no, it has the same DNA as we do. I know. That's <laughs> what I understand. Yeah. If you're going to move to Florida, consider this. Turn it upside down. And what do you got? The Grinch. <laughs> Since they have the governor there, why not? And here's Calvin right. and Hobbes talking about imaginary numbers. Uh, Calvin says to his friend, the tiger, here's another math problem. I can't figure out what nine plus four is. Ooh, says Hobbes. That's a tricky one. You got to use calculus and imaginary numbers for this. And that freaked Calvin out. Imaginary numbers, you know, says the tiger, 11th, 30, 12, and all those. It's a little confusing first. And he asked, how did you learn all this? You've never even gone to school. And Hobbes says, instinct, my son. Tigers are born with it. <laughs> we have to bring pie on him. And here's a little Lucy they just discovered in Ovalde Gorge, Ethiopia. <laughs> <That's weird. laughs> so they keep the other rocks. They can find Linus and Charlie Brown. And well, this is Andrew. topical because of the Lucy mission now in Dinkinash. Yeah. Coming up. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, they don't have much in that that original little dinky skeleton. I think her leg is missing, one leg and half her I arm. I thought they just had a skull. No, they, uh, no, they, they have body parts, too. It's a, they have, it's a yeah. relatively complete uh, skeleton, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Cleveland Museum. It was at the Cleveland Museum of Science. Near, is that uh, where it is? I've heard uh, it that's where to. I saw it, but that was 1990. And right. I've heard Lucy referred to it as the first like she yeah. somehow evolved out of the trees before anybody else. This yeah, everybody, one, I, mean, I have Ron, not seen that. I have not seen this. Everybody, one. Ron, what? everybody's interested in dating Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> you want to explain this one, Jerry? Because I didn't get this one. Oh, this yeah. One, no, this, this, was a, this was a video. And I think I've shown this like a year ago or something. It just shows a dog digging on the moon here. Oh, I see. Veteran diggers. The video is actually a video put together that shows the dog actually and dirt flying out and stuff. Or on a lot in Nevada for all the non-believers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here is uh, memes, as in Jupiter's sad face when she says she doesn't want <laughs> space memes. Look at that face. Yeah. Okay. It's based on a real picture of kind of elongated, uh, the big red spot. Well, I guess we're going to get depressed about global warming since there's not much we can do about it. But uh, we're going to start on the Earth. There's a time. lot we can do about it if we and we got to if we want to keep right. the place habitable for humans. What if that? Uh, there is a lot of discussion about that, especially you go back to think people look at facts. You know, PhD yeah. from the various universities, and you get a rather different opinion. No, you don't. Okay, I'm this all is, are the let's just. Let's just cover the, the data. Bruce, you know, I actually got, we used to have students from UCSB Astronomy come out and get extra credit at our observations. Uh -huh. And I actually got a rather embarrassing email from UCSB saying they weren't going to do that anymore because there was somebody that was railing about falsehoods about global warming. And I wonder who that was. Probably me. Okay, let's calm it down. 
<laughs> so um, this is um, what's called a cucumber glass. In uh, I couldn't find a really good picture of it, but this is close enough. A cucumber glass is usually about two feet high at the peak, and it's got glass on either side, and it's just tall enough to grow cucumbers in England. But <laughs> oh, that's what that is. Yeah. So tall it's um, this is a small miniature hothouse or a greenhouse. Yes. And what it does is it it creates an environment inside that is warmer than the native climate, say in England. And what's happening there is you see that it's made out of glass. There's a lot of glass. And interestingly enough, they used to make them after the Civil War in the U.S., they used to make them out, out of used photographic negatives because there were so many four by five inch and eight by 10 inch sheets of glass. They would just use them as the windows in their hothouse and the emulsion would gradually fade away and it just became effectively the glass. Mm. A lot of great photos went that way. But what happens is the sun, <laughs> the sun emits as if it were a black body in part of its spectrum, the peak part, not all the details follow down here, but this is what it would be like above the earth's atmosphere, this kind of curve for what the sun emits. Notice it's a log scale. And the black body, the sun's temperature is actually 5,800 degrees Kelvin, but there are 6,000 6, is close enough. It peaks in the visible band. So most of its radiation comes in. Um, is, uh, this is above the Earth. To get to the Earth's surface, you have to put on top of it uh, what the... Um... Oh, well, I'll go back to that. So... <laughs> Um, you have to put in the atmospheric transmission because a lot of this bounces off the atmosphere. Then um, what happens is the, the light comes in through the glass. We're talking about the uh, cucumber glass now. And then it heats up the inside. And it normally heats things to around the average Earth temperatures around 300 Kelvin. So, um, And this is what a 300 degree Kelvin body looks like. This is a human being. And the we are at equilibrium with our environment and so we radiate as a black body with this uh, curve for emission this is a 300 degree black body curve so um, light comes in and gets through the atmosphere and it heats up the it, through the glass it heats up the inside and then it tries to re-radiate but the problem is that the atmosphere doesn't is not transparent out here as as efficiently as it is for getting into so the the heat basically is trapped in here it can't get back out and so it warms up slightly and it's very good for cucumbers or tropical plants if you're into that now as i mentioned this is and i used to get a working at santa barbara research center where we made these kinds of cameras i would get a camera and i would take it to elementary schools and show kids what they things looked like and we look at things and different trash bags, uh, black trash bags that everybody's familiar with. Those are actually transparent at, at this wavelength. And so I would um, tell the kids that if you have anything that's 100% artificial, you might want to move to the back of the room while we're looking at the kids. <laughs> and, and all the girls would move to the back of the room. So, um, the, but this is a human being, uh, and this is a photograph made in, in the long wavelength band. Uh, in round because we peak at 11 microns in our output so this, this is an 8 to 14 micron band picture and we are the source everything else is is dark here when they first came out with uh, uh video cameras you know that you could buy for not a bazillion dollars uh they would be taking pictures and they would show women's underwear and so forth because they passed the infrared so yeah. they put an infrared filter in there, so that was then cut off. But Jerry, you just said moments ago that 300 degrees uh, Kelvin. Kelvin was yeah. a person that's, inside. Uh, that yeah, that's be, about that's... 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, oh, se really? Yeah. That e that equals so, 300 yeah. Kelvin. Yeah. Well, the absolute zero is minus 273. Hey, so, Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Wait. I, I, I also worked in this, uh, sorry to break in, I, I also worked in this world when I was at Lockheed Research Labs, 
one of our favorite visuals to show people was somebody drinking a hot cup of coffee. Because <laughs> you can yeah. see it all the way down their throat and everything. Uh, yeah, cool. that generally saturates the coffee cup. And <laughs> when he shows his mouth, that generally pure white, it saturates the detector. Yeah. Do you mind so if I ask one question that happened earlier? I know I've asked this before, but could you explain black body unless that's just off topic right now? Mm, that needs a slide. I think we'll get to these things. Um, let's let's go back. This curve is the as, as a function of wavelength. It's how much light uh, an object at this temperature emits at all wavelengths. It goes from zero to infinity. It's called the Planck radiation curve. Okay. And it's based on a continuum of radiation. It's not a line emitter. If you follow this curve, then that's considered a black body. And to look at the thing when it's cold, it's genuinely black. But if you look at it when it's at 6,000 degrees, it's bright. It's the sun. That's what the sun looks like, a black body. Oh, okay. So it has an absorptivity and an emissivity of one. I can't also, have both. I was going to mention that the you know the background radiation of the early universe exhibits this kind of uh, behavior. But yeah. of course, two point seven kelvins. So. Right, but it's it's way down here in the mud. You could yeah, right. Display it on this chart. Yeah, but that's what a it's an ideal emitter absorber. But the sun actually follows it for a lot of its spectral emission. This is transmission of typical glasses, and you see silica glass here is, um, let's see, silica is the green. Silica transmits up to and into the visible, but then it doesn't transmit out here in the infrared. So this one, fluorites, this glass is very efficient at transmitting light. So this would be what you would want to make your um, greenhouse or cucumber glass out of, <laughs> some kind of a fluorite glass, because it lets in all the peak radiation from the sun. But then it turns off, it does not transmit, it's it's opaque to the radiation. So it's very efficient at keeping uh, things in. If you want to make telescopes in the infrared, you have to use um, other things like this, uh, things that are transmissive to the infrared. Uh, telluride is a common one, selenides, sulfides, germanium. not so much sulfides. What's that? Germanium. Um, germanium, I don't recall where that fits, but we, I think, um, let's see, it's, um, one of them is magnesium fluoride. Well, I remember is the a, lenses that were on our infrared equipment were all made out of germanium. Okay. So you might've been working more in the short wavelength to mid wavelength. Well, three to five. Yeah. There was one that was, it was one that was common for long wavelength and it was, um, it was, it looked, it looked looked like a puddle of blood. It was blood red, and it was very fragile. If you put your finger on the lens, the thermal difference between the rest of the lens and where your finger warmed it up would cause the material to fracture. Oh, boy. So, oh, yeah, but wow. it, had, it had excellent um, optical properties, but it was a tricky material to handle in, in uh, applications. It, um, and typically, these infrared transmitting glasses have high refractive indexes, like two and three, whereas clear glasses have uh, refractive indexes about 1.4 and 1.5. But this but, whole this whole part of the heating problem so far has not introduced carbon dioxide. That's not part of this. No, we're talking about glass. I'm making an analogy to the atmosphere. Oh, you're making so, it into, okay. a glass. A glass lets in stuff and it blocks it going out. Now we're going to. So that applies, what happens that, is that, apply, that applies to all greenhouses. Then that, that applies to all greenhouses made out of glass. The ones that with plastic is different. The plastic is different. It has its own curves, and I don't think plastic works that well. Really, it probably absorbs a lot of heat in itself. It doesn't transmit. Yeah. So Earth radiation balance, here's the Earth. Um, you've got incoming solar radiation. The luminance is 1,370 watts per square meter. That's what, that's the density of the light hitting uh, heading toward the Earth. And then um, the Earth heats up on this side. When it rotates around to the other side, night side, <coughs> 
it re-radiates at whatever temperature it's at. They have it at 255 K, essentially 300. And that's the re and this is radiation from the front side. This here is reflection off of clouds and snow and stuff going back out. It's light that bounced off of us, so it gives us our albedo. You made the statement that the emissivity and the reflectivity are both one. I thought the some of those. No, I thought I said emissivity and absorption are both one. The reflectivity oh, yeah. is different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, then we're in agreement. Okay. <laughs> Um, this shows, now we, we had a, this is the equivalent transmission curve for our atmosphere. And this is the equivalent of the glass. Now down here, and most of what we see here is oxygen, water, and carbon dioxide. So this is the region here in out to one micron, <clears throat> start of the near IR. So the visible range that we get is right in here. So a 6,000 degree black body comes in and it has has about a 65% transmission through the atmosphere on average. Now the different bands that we use here for different applications are the short wavelength band here. This is used for communication and largely inside of uh, optical cables for uh, data links. Like your uh, if you re replace your um, cable from Cox with a fiber optic. It'll be operating in this infrared band. This is the three to five band. It's a mid-wavelength band. It has a big CO2 dropout because the CO2 is not transparent to this wavelength of light. It does not transmit it. Um, in, in the region of the water band, something very interesting happens, actually with the CO2 band too. Um, you can make a detector that uh, is blind to the atmosphere. It can't see anything. And it looks out because you make it centered on one of these, like this line here. You make it centered on here. And so it can't see anything, but it's a little wider. And so it can see just a little bit on each side. And you make it so it detects two colors at once, but separately. And then if you're looking at it and all of a sudden you see um, brightness in this band and simultaneously brightness in this band, you're looking at Doppler shifted CO2 or water. And that happens only in the exhaust of a missile. So that's wow. a missile warning system. And uh, that's oh. the problem I spent much of my career developing was the two color detector that could do that. And when that became a product line, um, um, missile warning systems became exponentially accurate. Before that, now, they weren't very these good. Are detectors, would... These are detectors, not filters, they're detectors. Detectors, yeah. No, you can't okay. do it with filters. You have to have okay. detectors. Now, this is a big water band in here. You don't see anything. And when you want to measure things in here, this is where you build your telescopes on top of mountain peaks. So you're not blocked from this radiation by water. Now, this is the part where this is the long wavelength band. And out here, where your 300 degree black body wants to try and get out. And you see that CO2 out here has completely stopped radiation getting out. Uh, you have a band here in CO2 and here in, in H2O. These things um, become more intense as CO2 um, increases. And so that alters the balance of the atmosphere. It's ability to balance its heat flow. Now, this is measurement of the atmospheric CO2 and um, emission of the CO2 from CO2 in the atmosphere and emission. This is the part atmospheric CO2, and this is the part of CO2 that we emit. And you see from the uh, early days here when the industrial revolution started in 1750, we've been slowly putting CO2 in our atmosphere. <clears throat> and this is the amount of, of CO2 that has always sort of historically been there. It does, once it starts up, it does follow this curve. But CO2 gets in the atmosphere from a lot of other sources. It gets in there from volcanoes primarily um, and from forest fires and things. So those contribute to this. But this is the contribution from the Industrial Revolution where we start really wholesale burning wood and then coal and oil. So, okay. 
So this is the carbon dioxide that we can measure from tree rings over 800,000 years. And you see it's running around between 200 and 250 part per million. Right now it's 400 and it's, it's even higher than this chart shows. It's about 450 parts per million. But this is the fluctuations from um, different ages, ice ages, things where CO2 was sequestered, um, forest fires, volcanoes, massive eruptions. Um, the highest point we reached in prehistory was 300 parts per million. And now uh, we started up here and now they've added on what's happening right now. So we are adding CO2, we are experiencing increased CO2 in the atmosphere. And a lot of it is what we add through our, our modern civilization. This um, is a calibration of what that CO2 does by measuring the amount of CO2 and measuring the average Earth's temperature. Now, we don't have a guy with a thermometer running around and sticking it in everything around the Earth, and then we mathematically average it. We look at the Earth from space, and we get an average temperature, depending on what we're looking at and how we're looking at it and what band it's in. But we get about, we measure empirically about 2.3 degrees centigrade of warming per doubling of CO2. So this is um, parts per million. The Historically, it was around 250, so around down here, 1850, 1990. Now it's up here at, um, uh, well, it's consistent with that previous chart. It's in the 400s. So um, it's continuing to increase. And the, the way, what we can do is um, what's the field is called, I should have, oh yeah, the field is called radiometry. And this is what I spent most of my career working on was, was radiometric balance of things, looking at things, how bright is a star that's far away. If we launch a hypersonic missile from a ship, um, the, it, when it starts off, it's doing Mach 8 off the ship and the, it creates an ionized layer in front of it that you can't see through. So how high in the atmosphere do you have to go before the atmosphere becomes clear enough that you can now see stars to navigate because supposedly the enemy has taken out your GPS system. Oh. So, so what we're looking at here with heating is the gazinta minus the gazauta and the stuff that remains, that's the heating. This is the spectral radiance emittance from, uh, this is the Planck radiation curve as a function of temperature, temperature and wavelength. And this gives watts per square centimeter per, per meter. This should be per meter. Yeah, for, that's the wavelength. There's the area. And my, the form I have is should be for micron. Anyway, the power is the integral of the transmission of the um, atmosphere. Because, you know, coming in, this is how much we, this is the amount of radiation that's knocking at the door. To get power in, you have to have the transmission of the atmosphere as a function of wavelength. And that is this curve. So you digitize this curve and you do the integral using that digital data for it going in and going out in the different wavelengths. Wavelength here would be short wavelength. This would be visible. And this would be, uh, we did it from zero microns to a thousand microns because that covers where the uh, curve goes goes way down. And the amount of heating you get for the earth is the power from the sun that gets through the atmosphere to the earth and then the power that um, the earth puts out. And the difference is what goes into heating with the famous delta Q is equal to MC delta T. <clears throat> so these calculations are very straightforward. They're easy to do. There's lots of data and they're continually gathering more data on it. So, oh, <laughs> so that's... <laughs> Well, can I ask so you there's a there's that. I should have put this chart above the other one because there are two ways to do it. <clears throat> what you get from that calculation is you can generate this curve or you can observe empirically observe this curve. And so those are two ways of getting the same information out. One is through a math calculation, and one is by having your satellites up there make these measurements. 
did you, Mr. Comments. President, did you ever use that that equation and substitute numbers or whatever into the C and the W and all those other things? Absolutely. Most... As a matter of fact, one time, one time uh, we went, to, um, uh, we were doing a radiometric signature of um, MiG-21 jet fighters in one of the previous Israeli wars. The Israelis had captured a MiG-21 and they brought it to Hughes Aircraft Company's airport down in Culver City. It's all apartment houses now, but it was surrounded by apartment houses then. And they strapped it down to the runway and I brought my infrared cameras down and we took signatures. We photographed the, the plume in infrared with the afterburner on. And it's strictly against rules down there because of noise abatement to run an afterburner in a jet, but we did it anyway. And we all rehearsed everything we're going to do. And the, the the switchboard operator was there and they said, okay, well, you probably have about 15 minutes before there's so many complaints, we have to comply and shut the plane off. So <laughs> we got all set up. We turned the thing on, turned on the afterburner, took a lot of data. And then uh, the guy at the control power leaned out and waved, cut it off. So we did. And then we took that data and we had spectral data. Uh, we did spectrometers of it. And so I sat there in those days, I sat there with a compass and a pen and a ruler, and I digitized the plots because we took them on, uh, what is it, a rolling graph paper and a pen. And so I digitized the thing, manually digitized. Later, they had less painful ways, but still time-consuming ways of digitizing graphics. And I spent a lot of time doing that because you couldn't always get the data in data format. You know, if you ask for data... Sometimes they'd send you a graph. So, but anyway, yes, I, I did a lot of that and digitized a lot of the, those formulas and then did numeric integration. Hmm. So, Very, in a practical world, with the advancement of our, of our uh, you know, solar energy now and, and trying to get electric cars, uh, what effect is that going to have on these curves that you see? The, the reason we have this CO2 in the app atmosphere from man is because we burn things that have carbon in them. We need to burn things that don't have carbon in them. Um, we need to switch from um, natural gas and coal. No, natural gas. We need to switch to hydrogen. We've got all the infrastructure in the country for natural gas. The pipes go everywhere. It would be silly to take those all out and replace them with electricity uh, because we've got all the pipes in there and hydrogen goes through the pipes just as well. And we can make hydrogen stink just like natural gas to alleviate its danger. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so th I see that as as something that's going to happen, and it's going to happen in cars too, because natural uh, hydrogen is easier to fill up at the at the uh, gas tank, at the power at the gas station, and we have all the infrastructure for all this gas station stuff. We just need to change it a little bit. But all that, all those. Um, what the old the way I look at them now is those sluggish piston pounder cars um, with all mechanical parts rubbing against each other and wearing out is a major expense. And um, that industry, if we go electric, that industry will all go away. All those jobs will be lost. So I don't see that completely going away because there's a lot of expertise there. And several things like jet engines don't work real well on electricity. So I think it's going to switch to hydrogen. So we're going to have a transition phase. The first one and the easiest one is electric cars. And you can, you know, the Santa Barbara just bought a whole bunch of electric buses. The U.S. Postal Department is going to buy all new electric um, uh, postal trucks. Yeah. So, so the point is we got to stop burning things with carbon in it. Burn There's one other thing hydrogen that... Hydrogen or, or take um, solar power. There is far more solar power delivered to the uh, United States than the entire world needs. I mean, in, and it's not, it's crazy different that we have way too much power in sunlight. And trust me, you heard it here first. In the future, uh, the uh, bad thing will be shade pollution. <laughs> Jerry, you mentioned, you mentioned to me once, I don't, I don't know if I should mention this, but if they, that the military has a way of, of getting uh, uh, solar energy at night. And, and, yes, there they are. Yeah, yeah, and you actually get more energy at night than you do in the daytime if you do their system. What it is is it's a, you have silicon that operates at what twenty eight percent efficiency in the daytime, 
At and best. Then, what's that? At best. Yeah. And then you have, um, you can put on certain infrared absorbing compounds because you have that 300 degree Kelvin line radiating light, heat out. Well, you can put the um, the, so, the infrared solar panels, you can put them facing down so they face the ground and you generate electricity from the 300 degree radiation emitted by the heated earth. I, I see. So, but those, those materials um, are very expensive and tricky to handle. Silicon is not. Silicon is the most common element on the surface of the earth. It's easy to mine. It's there, and it handles easily. So that's gonna that's gonna grow. We're gonna see most of our energy coming from the sun um, and solar panels. But well, uh, can, for the can military, I point, can I ahead. point out a, a difference that occurred to me uh, at, during this talk? One is you burn carbon, and you get nasty byproducts like CO two and even CO one, yeah. I guess perhaps, which are dangerous. But you burn hydrogen. Guess what? You get the stuff we're running out of. Yeah, well, we're and, not running. That's a myth too. We're not running out of water. You know, the the oceans are full of water, and all we got to do is leave the salt behind when we pick up the ocean water. Now, it means what what it means when they say we're running out of water is we're running out of cheap water. You know, water you just find in nature and then use. We're going to yeah. have to process it like we process milk or process oil into gasoline. Someday we're going to be processing seawater into drinkable water. Yeah. It's a lot of energy, salt, though. Salt's going to be tough to get rid of. No, no osmotic pressure or or um, uh, distill it with solar power. But both of those techniques are very energy intensive. Yeah, that's right. But we have more than enough energy in solar. They well, are whenever, energy intensive, and that's why they're going to be expensive. Water won't stay cheap. Whenever we burn hydrogen. Uh, like for example, there are hydrogen cars. Where does the water come out or go? Does it tailpipe? What tailpipe? Onto the street? Tailpipe? Yep. yep. Into the air. It's hot. It's steam. Do you suppose? Might it be conjectured that when the Hindenburg died in New Jersey, that there was water everywhere afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. It was water from the atmosphere water. Water because it was very hot. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It didn't cause a rainstorm. <laughs> okay, I just thought of that. Okay. Now, another another thing, Jerry, is that when when uh, you were saying that some of these things are they're very expensive, but don't doesn't the cost go down as as the uh, as it, you're increasing the number of, of them around, and then the, the efficiency yeah, that yeah. causes the cost to go down. And you see that with electric cars now. Um, Tesla is about to release their twenty four thousand uh, dollar. Um, Tesla and there are other there are other cars that are coming out at, at lower cost too and for my in my case I own a Y and I bought it in 2021 and it has come down nearly two decades close to twenty thousand dollars since we bought it of course we bought a fully loaded one with uh, the beta test drive it yourself brain which scares <laughs> the hell out of me yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> when but it works, it works beautifully. Possible. When it doesn't work, you know, everybody in the car, their hair stands up. <laughs> but uh, they've also now come out with, a, they're getting a lithium out of the batteries. And one is a sodium battery. That's yes. what uh, Elon Musk is at in Ballyhoo. Yes. Is. And the batteries are going to become cheaper. Um, there's a lot of they mythology about either. the what? And they won't catch on fire. Um, well, possibly. Pretty good at that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, gasoline catches on fire. Lithium catches on fire. It, yeah. it's, there's stuff out there. Just be careful. Well, you know, the big difference between gasoline and, and batteries is especially the uh, plastic fuel tanks we have now. You have to have a pretty severe collision to rupture the fuel tank, whereas it doesn't take much in the way of a, a hole through the batteries to short it out. And it's got a whole lot of stored energy right there. Boom. Yeah, and yet the majority of car fires are petroleum powered. Yeah, because they leave. Well, this is the majority of cars back, are petroleum powered. Back in the '60s, there was a guy that was trying, it patented or something, and tried to develop a car where you stored energy in a, a flywheel, a massive flywheel, uh, and it, it looked pretty good, except it was hard to turn corners with, 
with the car. <laughs> and, uh, and, in a collision, and, happened, and if you got in a collision, yeah. now you've got this flywheel spinning at, you know, umpteen yeah. jillion hertz per second or something. And uh, it's in the middle of this wreckage. And, you know, what's it going to do? Is it going to take off and walk away or run over people? And so it was a good idea, but it didn't work out practically. Another, another. Uh, buses, buses in Switzerland, they do that. They had a big flywheel right in the middle of the bus where they. Yeah. Would and another in. technology that was used was uh, compressed air. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Tra railroads used that when they had steam engines. They would run some steam engines on compressed air or compressed steam in the boiler. Uh -huh. And they could run it quite a bit before it uh, faded out and died, especially in mines where they didn't want to have exhaust in the mines. Anyway, it's, it's a very interesting world we're living in. So let's move on to um, let's move on to ooh the flyby. Think it yeah, out. this is the Lucy space space mission flew by. What is this called? Dinkinesh. Oh yeah, Dink D I N K I N E S H, and the oh, big surprise here is the little Dinkinesh. Yeah. So it has a, it has a um, moon. It's a so Dinkinesh. This picture was taken on November 1st, 2023. Hmm. It's from oh, a wow. range of about 270 miles away from the asteroid. Yeah, so it's another binary asteroid. And Dinkinesh, I think, is actually a, it sounds very Indian, but I think it's a, an African term uh, for a very old one or something like that. And it's one of the other names for Lucy. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, so Lucy is on a grand tour, and this was the I think the second of her tour satellites. So first, we should... it's, I think it's the first one. The other one is uh, Donald Johansson or something like that, the guy who discovered Lucy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then um, we've got about three or four more pictures over the next few years to see. Very amazing. This looks to me like a rubble, a couple of rubble piles. Is that it's kind of really powdery, huh? They're just going to take pictures. They're not going to land or try to. No, it's just a flyby. Just a flyby. Unless someone got the navigation wrong, and then it's an impactor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I I just looked up the meaning of Dinkinesh. It's Amharic, so one of those uh, uh, East African languages for um, "You are marvelous," and it's the uh, name they uh, use locally for for the Lucy skeleton. Mm. Okay. And you said this was 200 and something miles away. That's a pretty good sized rock, isn't it? 270 miles from the spacecraft, and it is. It's like 700 meters across or something like that, wasn't it? I thought I read that somewhere, but I don't I don't have it in the caption. Not or 700 feet across. I'm sorry. Yeah. At what and, the, and the little mini dinky is like 250 feet across. Okay. What diameter do they have to reach before they start going round on us and become six hundred mi miles? Oh, that geez. if they're made out of ice, yeah, yeah, because that's what Ceres is about six hundred miles in diameter, and it's round. And that's if you're ice, but if you're made out of, uh, well, this is rubble. So for yeah. a while, you know, you could probably get some that are spherical, and then yeah. you add more to it, and it would, yeah, it it it's a tougher problem when you when you've got. A mesh mismatch of stuff. Well, is it technically true that in science, or at least in astronomy, any two items, one of which could be called a moon, is not only orbiting, but they're all going to be called binaries, right? They're yeah. uh, whether it's a star being orbited, or maybe the planet that goes around the well, star is almost as big as the star, and they they just they two things in a planet. system, you know? Yeah. I just wonder if it reaches a point where, no, this is a moon, because the big one stays mostly still. Well, the Earth and the moon is a binary system. I've never heard it referred to as that. You just did. Well, yeah. first time. <laughs> I did. You're right. I, first time. <laughs> I think most people on the street wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I'm no, I, I, I agree. <laughs> Dinkinish. It doesn't sound like Arab. It sounds it's like Amharic. Okay. Funny. 
Where are we going now, Mr. President? Where are you taking us? We're going to the evening sky in Hercules, which is in the west. Uh, M13, the famous um, globular cluster is here. M92 is there. This is the symbol in this planetarium software for globular clusters. And up here in this bullseye area, it's not shown, is the comet Lemon. So this is where you look to see Lemon right now. Lemon has passed the sun. It is uh, recently uh, seven magnitude 7.9. It's brightening slightly because it's about to have passed by its closest approach to Earth, which it will do, um, I guess, next week or sometime this later this month. So, oh, here it is. Earth, its closest approach is on November 10. Oh. It passed by the sun uh, October 29, and it's estimated to possibly reach fifth magnitude, which makes it essentially um, invisible to the naked eye here, but an easy object in, um, in uh, binoculars. It is a fuzzy ball. It does not have a noticeable tail. Really? <laughs> hmm. It's got to be pretty early evening, though, right, Jerry? Yeah, for us. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think the, the time I picked, 7, 8, 7 p.m. tomorrow. Okay. okay. Well, the 10th is Friday, and then Saturday is our star party. Might it still be up there the next night? Oh, yeah. It's not going to okay. go away that fast. Yeah, if, if we have the trees aren't in the way. Yeah, the, the, trees trees. Will be right, the trees are going to be dead center. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bummer. There's a chance maybe from the elevated area by the pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should be an easy object. If you can get the M13 and Hercules up, you know, you go a little farther west and there you are. And it's northwest, so it's um, it's um, it'll get you a little teeny bit more height than M13. And did we ever establish which astronomer was named Lemon? No, this is the Lemon Observatory in, in Arizona. Yeah, Mount Lemon. Oh, yeah. Of Tucson. And the fruit is, just has one M. Yeah, and my right. spell checker will not tolerate lemon with two Ms. <laughs> it's also spelled like my favorite actor of 50 years ago, Jack Lemon. Yeah, Jack, Jack Lemon. Lemon. Yeah. Oh, did he have two Ms in there? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pretty sure. So I'm suspecting that that uh, lemon is... Uh, a derivative French word, the name, Le Mans. <laughs> Le Mans, huh? Uh, so I guess you could say, gentlemen, at any one time, there's an average of how many comets in the night sky? Dozen, half a dozen, three, four? Well, you got to define your limit as to what brightness it's at. Right. I mean, every comet is still in the night sky. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ones that we see that come in and visit us, we're not still looking at Halley's where it went. Sure. Are we? No, you you can you can still uh, Halley's just uh, just rounded the curve and it's headed back in. Yeah, and uh, it can be imaged. Yeah, uh, yeah. With fact, a big enough telescope. I've seen uh, images of Halley's within the last year. Current images. Um, yeah. The, there's a massive amount of stars that are streaks in the photograph, but there is a little fuzz ball in the middle. So they, you can get it. It's not a and big fuzz ball. But... And old man Halley, I think we talked about this before. He calculated how often it would come, even though it, did he live as long as Seven, six, six, six years? Oh. He, he predicted its return, but he said, uh, I won't live to see it. But uh, I hope that posterity will note that it was an Englishman that predicted its return. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lemon. I've never heard of the Lemon Observatory. Yeah, so Lemon. it's it's up on Mount Lemon, right above Tucson. Right, oh. it, it's there's a sixty inch, a sixty one inch. I looked through both of them. Yeah, I thought the kit was down there. Is that no? Kit that's kit. Kit. yeah. That's uh, that's southwest of Tucson, Arizona, by about fifty miles, roughly. Okay, at least. I got what's, what's the name of this comet again, Jerry? Lemon H two oh. Lemon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's call it the Jack Lemon comet. The Jack Lemon. Whatever. Well, there are probably tells. multiple. There are probably multiple lemon comets, but this is, you know, C two O two three H two or whatever. Yeah. Huh. 
So they just scan the skies and occasionally they'll come up on a fuzzball that they wouldn't have had any indication. You just got to scan, right? That's yeah. The and then you got to look at it the next night and see if it moved. Right, right. That that observatory is sort of focused, no, no pun intended, but it's focused on, you know, uh, tragic events that could happen if uh, these these things, you know, come close to the earth. So I'll bet you it was part of that program that discovered this guy. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, searching for near Earth impact, near Earth impact. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Any old? We probably miss some sometimes too. I imagine there's a lot of sky up there, isn't there? It's easy to miss the little ones, and it's mm. easy to miss them when you have you know six thousand Starlink satellites whizzing through your view. <laughs> well, now every every so often we get a scarce story about an asteroid that's going to near miss Earth. Have we had any comets near miss Earth? Yeah, uh, Halley's Comet in 1910, I think it was. Yeah, the um, the Earth actually passed through the tail of Halley's Comet. Right, and the snake oil artists were out there selling all sorts of uh, devices <laughs> and and pills, right? <laughs> to keep you from being poisoned by the cyanide in the tail. <laughs> well, is that a yearly radiant now? The Halley's. Uh, Twice a year, you get uh, meteor showers from Halley's Comet. The October one during our campout, the Orionids are pieces of Halley's Comet. I don't seem to recall it being called a, a meteor, uh, the Halley's meteor shower. No, it's called the Orionid because yeah. meteor showers are named after the constellation where the radiant point appears. Right. Oh. Even if that constellation no longer exists, they still carry the name on it. <laughs> but they knew about a... these showers way before they knew where they came from. It took a lot of analysis and observation to figure out where they came from. This is this is an interesting hop on this uh, slide you have up here. Just take the the belt. Yeah, you got yeah. that uh, star hop right. Yeah. This this is you just the belt and you just continue straight down two belt lengths to here, and this is the um, Angel Nebula. Ah, uh, NGC twenty one seventy. Can you see that in a scope here from Earth? Yes. Okay, good. And this is the this is a photograph of the angel thing. Wow. It's actually sort of upside down. These these are wings, or the, these are wings, and this is the um, skirt, you might say, yeah. like for the Christmas tree top. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was trying to get an angel figure from the nebulosity, you know, the like the red and the black, and it wasn't working out. But yeah, yeah. that's much more obvious that way. Yeah, this is this is the angel wings, and this is the skirt coming down. And she must have spilled some punch on her dress or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it's part of the unicorn. It's a very rich region of the uh, sky with... Um, yeah. That whole yeah, Orion molecular complex area. Yeah, there, there's... Oh, you got the Rosette Nebula and mm -hmm. Christmas Tree Cluster and Nebula. Hubble's um, Variable. Hubble's mm -hmm. Variable, Flame Nebula, the Running Man Nebula down here. Mm -hmm. M43. M42 is the Orion Nebula. That Hubble's Variable Nebula, that's the first uh, thing that was imaged with the Hale Telescope. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. And down here, of course, is the um, brightest star in the sky, Sirius. Right. Yeah, and so the, the bell's down, belt, down right. here. Yeah, this is the, the, the winter Doors sky. Helmet. Yeah, the winter sky with all its bright stars and all its nebula. It's a wonderland. Okay, is it visible this Saturday night, what we're looking at here? Yep. It's this, rising this, pretty late. It's a little uh, late. Yeah, I saw Orion up around 11. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, this uh, is midnight view. And it's got to come up over the museum, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be January, February, mm -hmm. when that will be best for the museum star parties. Yeah. yeah. And well, it, my it's is really upset by having a thin layer of clouds up there, not so thick that you can't see through them. Yeah, but Chuck they, Owens this out at uh, star parties if you follow the belt up you get the pleiades if you follow the belt down you eventually come to sirius oh really yeah it's a nice little guide set yeah oh oh i didn't know that about the pleiades that's interesting okay yeah 
That's that I learned that one from Chuck. The other thing is that the belt stars are right on the equator, the celestial equator. So it's uh, that that thing comes right up over the east point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's very the biggest it, biggest concentration of bright stars you get all year long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the lines they draw off the stick figure for Lepus is, is distressing like a swastika. Yeah. <laughs> well, that Heinz Crimson Star out there, that's a tough little star hop, but it's possible. This one? No, uh, way to the right, on the, the right, right, right edge. edge. Right edge of the of your uh, of your yeah. image there, right, right there, right above. That's it right yeah. there. It's yeah. real pretty. Yeah, that's oh. a tough little star hop. You know what it is? There's two stars at the top of Lepus there, and that I use, and then you go half of that distance again out and then just wander around until you finally which find direction which direction is out uh to the to the to your, your right so in other words there's two brighter stars in lepus uh at the top of lepus um right here yeah go left and you're going to have there's going to be two one below below you there and then off to the left uh again go left the same direction uh the other direction like it, it extend Heinz Crimson, uh, Heinz Crimson Star as a line going left to your left. So our neb down there, farther down. Right. Yeah. It's um. In, in M seventy nine is a nice glob. Oh, our neb. You mean here and here? You know, just to your left again. You go to the left of that. And and it, it it's a. Uh, so it this be, is this is left. Right. Yeah, and, and <laughs> add a diagonal down. In other words, create a, there it is, that one. So that one and the other star that you were on, you go about half that distance again out to the right. Oh, I see. You, you run into Heinz Crimson Star. But okay. it's a it's a real, it's not exactly a straight line, but it's it's a tough little hop. Yeah. Tim has a thing for carbon stars. Tim yeah. likes carbon stars. Yeah, I like carbon stars. And one night I had customers sitting around and I said, well, let me show you Heinz Crimson Star. And 15 yeah. minutes later, I said, well, I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it goes some nights uh, yeah, yeah some nights it's tough but gentlemen chances are most of these stars are binaries or triples or even more than that how often do you see the two stars or the three uh does that take a big scope can you see them in your little scopes Just the belt on the, the belt is naked eye yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, talk I'm talking about individual binaries where you see one as a, you know, naked eye, you see just a one like we're looking at now, but you get up close and suddenly it's a binary. There's two. Can you see those two? Yeah, Sometimes. quite often. Really? Well, Miser Alcor, uh, Alcor uh, Chuck, tell uh, Baron about Mizar, that. Miser, yeah. Miser and Alcor in the handle of the Big Dipper, um, that's a visual double, not a binary. But mm -hmm. Mizar is a is a binary, the first binary discovered, and then each one of the two components of Mizar is a spectroscopic binary. So there's four stars in in Mizar, and there's also two stars in Alcor. So it's like six stars where you see two if you have good vision. And, and there was some story about being being an archer or a. Yeah, yeah. If you could see the two, the visual double in it, Mizar means the puzzle comes from a phrase that means the puzzle or the test. And Alcor comes from a phrase that means the answer, because in ancient <laughs> Arabia, if you could see the two, you could be an archer in the army. If not, you were a marcher. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's really good. I really like that. Uh, <coughs> I just wonder if uh, because they're orbiting as binaries, they might cross each other's path or get close enough that the to the naked eye, it might appear to become a variable it brightens a little does that yeah happen? sure you get eclipsing binaries that's algal mm -hmm. oh yeah but there's none up there that you can see with a naked eye two stars orbiting sure. oh yeah the handle of the dipper really yeah. it looked like you can see two stars that really are one it well in your eyes yeah or considered one or you got one name and they're in a system a binary system wow well, Alberio, they used to think was a binary, but they've now discovered it's about 300 light years apart. Yeah, that, that comes and goes with the Hipparchos and then Gaia, and <laughs> whether they <laughs> might be loosely bound or not. Yeah. Yeah, Mizar was the first binary discovered. So um, that's, not, that's not something you detect with your eye. So I'm going to say most binaries are telescopic or binocular, but um, 
but you can actually see them in their orbits. You can actually plot their orbits over periods of like 70 years or so. So that's something that Herschel was big on doing. Yeah. But in effect, a star cluster is nothing but a giant conglomeration of, it's not just two stars, it's hundred going yeah. around each other, aren't they? Sometimes a million. So that's, geez. But we see it as a fuzzball. A couple of quick questions of our outreach guy. Uh, we're going to have a uh, seven o'clock setup time and the public is. Uh, oh, uh, no, seven o'clock is the start time for the star party this Saturday. So setup is at six. OK, there will be no no planning meeting at five because we've got people missing and there's nothing really pending. Right. And uh, then uh, actually uh, Wednesday of this week uh, coming up is uh, Santa Barbara Community Academy. We'll be bring telescopes there. And then the 16th is Hope School. Uh huh. Oh, the, the Community Academy, that's the Lacumbro School, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then when are we out at Westmont? Westmont is the 17th, Seven. Friday. Seven. And then the Saturday after that's Los Flores, uh, Bruce. Oh, the, good. I, I want to go there. All right. And then December 1st is our big December so, party, if you will, our first Friday with uh, elections. So, may I do you mind if I add something? So I, I just, uh, this is completely off what you guys are talking about, but I just got the December issue of astronomy and there are two really good articles in there. One's by Dave Eicher on Lincoln looking through the Naval uh, Telescope, the Naval Observatory Telescope. It's really, really neat because he loves history. He loves astronomy. Yeah. The other one I was going to ask Chuck, do we have a member named David Grossman? Do you know that name, uh, Chuck? Uh, doesn't ring a bell. Uh, okay. So he wrote a really nice article on uh, kind of like uh, music and astronomy. It's, it's really beautifully written. I think he's local? A, he gave he's a, a talk source. at our, he gave a, he was a graduate student at UCSB and he gave a talk at our thing about three or four years ago. I remember David mixing the two of music and astronomy. Oh, I mean, he he's associated with the Santa Barbara uh, Symphony Orchestra. Okay, uh, as an executive, uh, he, he looks a little older than a graduate student to me. Okay, well maybe it's maybe I'm mixing more people up. Yeah, yeah that was Brian May in the mix too. Yeah, he, he wrote a nice article anyway. Did you read the? Yeah. Um, okay. Did you did you read Bob Berman's uh, article, his column, in Astronomy Magazine? Um. He's going to be yeah, our was, speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep, I, I'll be our it. speaker March. March 30, he's going to be back on. This time we'll come oh, yeah. up with okay. him. Hey, gentlemen, thank you. I learned a lot. And okay. I appreciate it. Let's do it again. And we'll see you at the star party and then back here Monday morning for SBAU Astro Hour. Thanks, Larry.